Hey, Grace Place. Great to see you. I've been away for a couple weeks, went on a trip, and every time I'm out of town, I'm thinking about you guys and want to get back to my family, my church family, and looking forward to that very much. We uh, just did a, another one of these Footsteps of the Apostles trips. We were over in Greece and in Rome with about 30 people from Grace Place or a few families who were connected or friends that were connected to people from Grace Place. There's a picture of our group in front of the library in Ephesus, which is an amazing archaeological um, uncovering reveal that's been going on for over a hundred years. And you can visit it in West Turkey, actually, very close to Greece. And uh, <clears throat> this is a place where the Apostle Paul was for a couple years. He was there on more than one occasion. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that today. By the way, because people keep asking about it, we're uh, looking at possibly doing another trip to Greece in the last week of May, early June next year. Nothing to push. If you're interested in that, I, the, I've been there a number of times, and I'm not doing this for me. I'll be doing it for you if you want to do it. So if you're interested, uh, my wife will be in the conference room by the fireplace after this service with all the information. And uh, if it's something that you're interested in, let us know right away. If not, that's fine, too. I want to talk to you about where we're going the next few weeks, the next few months with our sermon series. Um, <clears throat> starting in three weeks, we're going to do a series for October and November that I'm very excited about. I wrote a book that I want to share with you. It's called, I Want to Be Left Behind, Finding Hope in the Return of Christ and the Renewal of All Things. And uh, <clears throat> I'm placing an order tomorrow for a bunch of these, and so we'll be distributing those in two weeks. If you're interested, I hope you'll get one of these and you'll read it. I think this is going to be uh, an inspiring series. I've been spent a lot of time thinking about this as I was writing this book this year, and I hope that you will um, participate in it starting in three weeks. And then next, uh, in two weeks, we're going to have baptisms, as you heard, and uh, gonna do, we're going to do a, a family service. Some of our older kids that are usually not with us will be with us, and I'm going to do a message called, How Real is Heaven? And this is, uh, I'm going to present some material I've never presented before that, I, that I've been fascinated with and learning recently, and I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be a part of that as well. And then next week, <clears throat> I'm going to do a message called, A Savior Who Never Disappoints. And uh, we're going, I'm hoping to bring some perspective and calm to this angry, divided situation that we're in now as we're coming up on an election. I don't know about you, but I cannot wait for November 6th when we get past this thing. There'll still be anger and division in our world, but not like it is when we're coming up to an election where we get so obsessed sometimes and so wrapped up in it, okay? So <clears throat> I hope you'll be here next week. I've been thinking and praying about this message for a couple months, and I'm going to be pre preaching it to myself as well as to you. Now today, I'm going to do a message called Acts 29, The Story Continues. It's the unfinished book, the book of Acts, and uh, we'll get into it in just a moment. If you have a Bible, we're going to start at the very beginning. In Acts chapter 1, we're going to do a flyover. But I wanted to let you know that this weekend is important, is special, because we are celebrating our 28th anniversary as a church. That's pretty cool, huh? And uh, we kind of, we've decided over, to, over the years, we decided to make a big deal out of it and have a major party on the five-year increment. So if you were here three years ago on our 25th anniversary, it was a pretty big party. And we'll look forward to something like that again in a couple years on our 30th anniversary. But I like to bring it up every year, the second or third weekend. It, it was September 14 that we started on. Today's the 15th, uh, 1996 in the Berthoud High School Auditorium. And God put a, a burden on my heart. My wife and I felt a call from God to move here from Maryland and start this church from scratch and stay with it for the long haul. And it's been quite an adventure. And from the very beginning, we wanted to create and build a, a, a church that was kind of like the, what we read about in Acts, you know, on, on an on authentic Acts-type church where God was moving and working and showing up and people were being saved. And so the summer of 96... We hadn't yet launched, and uh, so we met in mountain parks and parks around here and up and down the Front Range and community centers. We met, and we just studied together, and we talked about what does a healthy church look like. And so we spent a lot of time in the book of Acts, and we uh, sought to um, 
be just that kind of a church that we read about in these pages. So here's what we're going to do today. We are going to do an overview of Acts, okay? And I, in the past, have a couple times spent a couple months teaching through Acts, two or three months. So this is one message, all right? So get ready, put on your seat belts, put up your seats, put your trays in their, in their uh, upright position because we're on the taxi and we're going to take off and we're going to fly through the book of Acts. Um, <clears throat> as I'm reading the book of Acts again this week, uh, questions are coming to me. Like, what does it mean to really quit playing church and build authentic community? To really lean in to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives and our church? What does it mean to take off masks and become real with each other and to know and be known and, and to love each other like ourselves? To truly care for each other and support each other and encourage each other and hold each other accountable and, and mentor and be mentored in what we see happening here in Acts. Um, I had the privilege of, of uh, visiting the uh, AA meeting that meets here on Wednesday nights and has been for five years. And so it was their fifth year, uh, their five year anniversary this Wednesday. And so they invited me to come and <clears throat> I'd never been to a meeting like that. And so I didn't know what to expect. And it was very inspiring really to hear the stories and the testimonies. And some of those folks are coming here. Some uh, have been for some time and some very recently. And so welcome if you're one of those folks. But uh, <clears throat> what I noticed uh, especially was the the, the atmosphere of love, acceptance, and forgiveness, of, of, of unconditional love, of, of total support, and of honesty. And I, I thought, you know, really, that's what God wants all of us to experience, whether we're struggling with addiction or not. That's what he wants us to experience. What does it mean to not just get saved, but be transformed by the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit? To live a life that's increasingly marked by the fruit of the Spirit equipped by the gifts of the Spirit, victorious over sin by the power of the Spirit, witnessing for Christ with courage in the world, with the anointing of the Spirit. That's what I see in the book of Acts. And what does that look like today? What does it mean to unite with other kingdom warriors on an epic adventure with high stakes, eternal stakes, life and death? To open our hearts and churches to the full power of the Holy Spirit, to pray for and receive holy boldness from on high, to share our faith? What does it mean to give our lives for the mission of Jesus, to seek and to save the lost, to realize that every day we are encountering people who are going to go to a, a Christless eternity unless they hear and understand and receive the life-changing message of the gospel of grace in Christ Jesus and surrender their lives to him as Savior and Lord? These are the type of questions that I wrestle with when I read the story of the first church in Acts. Because here in Acts, we see a church that is full of committed Christ followers, and, and they're building healthy, spirit-supercharged, on-fire local churches. And it's an epic adventure, really. In fact, somebody should do a, you know, Lord of the Rings movie scope style, you know, feature, probably have to be a series on the book of Acts, because it would be dynamite. Once the Holy Spirit fell and the believers received God's power, the results were amazing. They started with 12, and then there were 120 in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit, and then there were 3,000 baptized in one day, and then a few weeks later, there were 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Within no time, there was a 20,000-member megachurch in Jerusalem before the gospel ever spread outside of Jerusalem, which it did, and it continued, and it continued, and today it continues. The church went through rapidly through the Roman Empire, planting churches everywhere, lives being changed, and in fact, within no time at all, Christ followers were being, uh, it was being said of them that they had turned the world upside down. Dwight L. Moody once said, the nearer we get to the apostolic spirit and methods, the more power we will have. And I agree. And so Acts is a place to come back to over and over again. So if you have a Bible, we're going to start at the very beginning in Acts chapter 1. At the top of the page in my Bible, it just says Acts. Some translations, you'll say Acts of the Apostles. But it should say just Acts, like mine does, because if it was going to be added to, it would be more accurately Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. After the resurrection, it says here that Jesus appeared over a period of 40 days to his disciples and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. 
Luke is the author. He wrote the gospel according to Luke. He was a doctor and a researcher, and he researched it carefully. And then he wrote Acts as a follow-up to his gospel. And in the early verses, Jesus meets with the disciples, and he tells them he wants them to wait in Jerusalem for a gift that he's going to give them, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But they want to know, when is he going to restore the kingdom to Israel, they ask him. And look, look at what he says. <clears throat> Acts 1, 8, or 7 and 8. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Stop there for a minute and notice this. Not for you to know what? Times or dates. Unfortunately, many believers want to fixate on when is Jesus coming back. When is it going to happen? What is happening in the news in Israel and in all the other places around the world? It'll tell us the book of Revelation is about ready to be fulfilled. And sometimes we get obsessed with that. We're going to talk a lot more about that in October and November as we talk about the finding hope in the return of Christ and the renewal of all things. My title on that book might shock you, but I'll explain it as we get into it. He says, don't focus on that. I want you to focus on something else. Don't focus about when. Focus on what you need to be doing until it happens, okay? He said, you will receive what? Power. Greek word here is dunamos. And it's, <clears throat> we get our English word, dynamite. That's the kind of power he's talking about. Life-changing, explosive, blowing stuff up, dynamite power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my what? Be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now listen, Jesus was talking to his original team at that moment, but this is recorded under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for us who are also a part of that expanding team. We're his disciples, and so his heart for us is the same. You will be my witnesses, he says. That's what he wants for us. It's, it's rightly been said, his last command should be our first concern. Our task as followers of Christ is to be witnesses. What is a witness? A witness is just somebody who reports what they've seen and heard, right? They don't have to have studied a lot of stuff. They just need to be able to clearly say what they've seen and heard. Now, if you have accepted the gospel, if you've given your life to the Lord, you've been saved, then he has done something for you in your life. And you might not think it's dramatic, but he has done something to change your destiny and your current reality and you can share that with other people. And when you do, that's being a witness. You don't have to be trained. You don't have to be polished. You don't have to read the whole Bible and understand it all. Nobody understands it all. You don't, you don't have to, you know, go to seminary or anything. You just have to have encountered Jesus. And when Jesus changed their lives, they were unashamed of it. And they wanted to make it known. So they shared their testimony in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit anointed their words. And there was dynamic impact because of power, the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit. And so here in verse 8, we see a strategy that Jesus outlined, not only for them, but for us. Basically, he's saying, go to Jerusalem first. That's where they were. So go where you are, your neighborhood, your house, your, your workplace, your, you know, your, your hobbies, your recreation, your, your gym, whatever. Go where you are and see where God might open doors for you to share. And then move out as you can. Judea and Samaria. Judea was the region. That'd be like the front range. Samaria represented cross-cultural evangelism. And, and so be open to where you can cross barriers that are normally not crossed, cross-cultural barriers to share. And then to the ends of the earth as far as possible. Uh, global missions that we participate in as we are able. Verse 8 also, by the way, serves as an outline for the book of Acts. Let me show that to you. Because the first seven chapters focuses on the birth and growth of the church in Jerusalem. And then chapters 8 through 12, they branch out into Judea and Samaria due to persecution that scattered the church, as we'll see in a moment. And then chapters 13 through 28 is the ends of the earth, the three missionary journeys of Paul and finally his journey to Rome. And so as we are doing this flyover, we're just going hit to the, hit the high points of these three sections of the book of Acts. Now, 
The disciples took seriously the words of Jesus that they would wait for the Holy Spirit. They went into an upper room. In Acts 1, you read, there was 120 of them waiting, 10 days praying every day, 10 days waiting. And then it happened. Chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell dramatically upon the church. And the power that they were waiting for came. And the disciples began to preach, and people heard it in other languages. It was a miracle. They had come from all over the, the world for Pentecost, and they began to hear in their own languages from these other countries, and they, were, they, they then listened as Peter preached the cross of Christ, and he said, you are the ones that crucified him. And they were, they were convicted. They were struck to the nerve because they, many of them hadn't even been there. How can you say we crucified him? Well, it wasn't Pilate. It wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't those soldiers. It was us, all of us, because it was our sins that put him there. And deep conviction came on those people. And they said, what should we do? And Peter says, repent and believe and be baptized. And look what happened, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. If you keep reading there in Acts 2, it describes a little snapshot of what a healthy church, fresh off the anointing of the Holy Spirit, looks like. It says three times they were together, together, together. They shared with those who were in need. They, they devoted themselves. It wasn't an optional thing to come to church. They devoted themselves to the teaching, the teaching of the word, and to, to being together and to fellowship and to supporting each other and to uh, dropping those masks and, and going deep in community with each other. And then you get to the very end of that chapter, and it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The church was growing <clears throat> because God was growing it. You see, God grows the church. We don't grow it. But God grows healthy churches. He looks around for churches that are healthy, and he says, hey, there's somebody that's seeking. I can send somebody there. That's why we want to give our energy not so much to growing the church, but to being healthy so that God can grow the church. And that's what we see at the very beginning as it kicked off, and it was born, and the momentum began. The disciples began to witness with, with holy boldness in chapter 3 and 4. I mean, these are different people than we saw at the end of the Gospels. At the end of the Gospels, the disciples were all hiding with the door locked. Why? Because their Messiah had just been murdered, as far as they could see, and they thought they were next, and so they were hiding for fear of the Jews. But now, all of a sudden, something changed. What changed? The resurrection. They had seen him. They had touched him. They had listened to him. They had hung out with him for 40 days, and they were convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus was alive and that nothing else mattered except for declaring him. And so now they are new people. They were filled of holy boldness. And we see this in chapter 3 where, where John and Peter heal a man at the temple and a bunch of people gather around. They begin to preach Jesus, and the Jewish authorities are alarmed. They thought they shut down Jesus on the cross. And now here these guys are preaching that he's alive. And so they drag him, them, into jail, throw him into jail where they spent the night. And the next day they bring them into court, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law, the high priests. And they said, hey, stop it. And, and they, Peter, it says, filled with the Holy Spirit, chapter four, verse eight, begins to preach Jesus to them. And they don't know what to do with it. He tells them salvation is found by in no other name except the name of Jesus. And, and look, what, look what happens in verse 41, uh, or verse 13, excuse me. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that they had been, what? With Jesus. You see, you do not need a seminary degree to be used by the Lord. You do not need that to witness for Jesus. What you need is one important thing. Spend time with him. Because they had been with him, they had a message that was contagious. They were unschooled. They were ordinary, but they had been with Jesus. Now, the religious leaders didn't know what to do with them. They said, man, we can't deny there was a miracle, but we can't let them keep doing this. What are we going to do? They said, well, let's just tell them not to do it anymore. So they did. And they said, you stop it. Don't speak or teach in the name of Jesus anymore. Verse 18. And I, lo I love their reply in verse 19. 
<clears throat> but Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? I imagine it was silent. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Don't you like that? That's holy boldness. That's courage that comes from being with Jesus and knowing that nothing else matters more than declaring him. And that's what they were dedicated to do. So they, they kind of, the, the court didn't know what to do, so they just said, go home. So they left, and where'd they go? Straight to their small group for prayer meeting. They go to their small group in the end of chapter 4, and the, the prayer is recorded here. You can read it. It's beautiful. And what do they pray? Now, you'd think they'd be praying, Lord, we just got arrested. We spent the night in jail. They were mean to us. They're going to kill us next time. Keep us safe. No, 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 no. They didn't pray anything about safety. What did they pray? They prayed for more boldness. They said, give us boldness, Lord. And the whole place shook because God was pleased with that prayer. And the rest of that, the book of Acts is all about holy boldness. It's, it's really inspiring. In the early chapters through chapter 7, the church develops and grows in Jerusalem. And it continues strong in Jerusalem until the first Christian martyr. In chapter 7, Stephen, one of the deacons who had been, who had been appointed to serve the poor, was killed for his faith. He, he was brought to trial. He was preached for his faith. And they stoned him to death. And, and so after that, a great persecution broke out. And chapter 8, verse 1 says, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout all where? Judea and Samaria. Remember, Jesus said, that's where I want you to go to. Well, how did they go? They were scattered by persecution. This is part two as they start to launch out with the church. It was persecution that spread the believers and fueled church growth, really. It's often been said the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. How did persecution spread the message? Well, verse 4 says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. <laughs> they couldn't help it. They were so excited about Jesus knowing that he died for their sins and that he was raised and he was coming back and that he left them with a message from on high. <clears throat> Everywhere they went, they talked, they talked, they talked about it. And there was converts, there was, there was opposition and there was uh, success. Both were, were the case of preaching the gospel. Chapter 9 is the dynamic story of the Apostle Paul's conversion. He was called Saul at first and he was persecuting the church. He was a Pharisee. He was zealous for the law, and he was against these Christians. He was there uh, approving the, the, the stoning of Stephen, and then he was on the road to Damascus to go find Christians and put them in jail or, or torture them or even kill them. And while he was on the, the journey to Damascus, Jesus, the resurrected, glorious Jesus, has encountered him. And he was knocked off his horse and he was blind for three days. But when his eyesight was restored, he began to go back through the, whole, the, the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, without the blinders. And began to see Jesus everywhere. And after several years of in-depth study, of, he began, became so convinced and so compelled by the gospel that he had, he had to take it to others. And he became the great apostle Paul and wrote the majority of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 10, another dramatic turn. God gives Peter a vision, and this vision results in a radical change of thinking, not only for Peter, but for all the early Christians, about Gentiles. Because the Jews had this idea that they were the chosen people of God and need to hunker down and protect themselves, and, and everybody else was the enemy, the Gentiles, the non-Jews. God says, no, I chose you to be evangelists to the world, and you missed the point. My heart is for all people. And, and, and so Peter goes and shares with the uh, centurion and his whole family, this Roman centurion, his whole family become believers. And Peter's like, wow, look what's happening. He comes and tells the story in Jerusalem. And everybody says, we now understand God knows no favoritism. God knows no racism. God wants his gospel to go to all people. And this per change of perspective was huge because now non-believers were not viewed as the enemy but they were viewed as people who might be hungry for what they had to give them, the gospel of grace in Christ Jesus. And this new way of thinking opened the door to take the gospel to the whole world. 
And so what we see now is missionary journeys. Three major missionary journeys happening, beginning in Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3, where the church at Antioch decides to send Paul and, um, and also Barnabas. Paul never traveled by himself. He gave a good model for us. He was always with other associates. And so in chapter 3, it says they, the Holy Spirit told the, the elders that they were to set apart Barnabas and Saul and send them out. So they placed their hands on them. They fasted and prayed, and they placed their hands on them, and they sent them off. I love this church in Antioch because they were a missionary. They were a sending church, a missionary sending church. And it's often been said, and it's true, that the health, health of a church is more determined by its sending capacity than its seeding capacity. And I hope that we can always be that kind of a mission-minded Antioch-type church. So they send off Barnabas and Saul on this first missionary journey. And the first missionary journey, they leave Antioch here. They've sailed down through Cyprus. And they come up, which is now central Turkey, into this region of Galatia. And they planted a number of churches here in Galatia. And then they went back to them to encourage them and make sure they were they were uh, growing and strong, and then they went back to report to the sending church in Antioch what had, had happened. Shortly after they had planted those churches and established pastors there and, and um, made sure they had healthy foundations, there were false teachers that followed on Paul's footsteps. And they started it's confusing the new Christians, the Gentile Christians, and they start saying things like this. Yeah, Paul told you about Jesus, but he didn't tell you the whole thing. He didn't tell you about Moses. You all need to be circumcised, and you need to observe all the laws of Moses as well as believing in Jesus. Jesus is not enough. It was a Christ plus something gospel, which Paul would later declare is no gospel at all. So he wrote his first letter. He sat down and wrote a letter to these churches, and it's in our Bible. It's called Galatians. And in that, what we now call a book, he blasted those false teachers and, he, and he, he, he emphasized the importance of keeping the main thing the main thing, which is the gospel of grace in Christ Jesus. It's a powerful message. If you haven't studied it, I, I'd love to have you read a book I wrote on it called The Main Thing. It's available at the Connection Center, and it's all about that letter to the Galatians and the centrality of the gospel. In the next chapter, in chapter uh, 15, the uh, disciples all came together, the apostles, the leaders, for a conference. We now call it the Jerusalem Council. And the, the purpose of this council was to decide whether or not new Gentile believers had to get circumcised and observe all the law of Moses. And after much prayer and conversation, they decided the answer was no. They need to accept Jesus and trust Jesus alone, not Jesus plus Moses. And so Paul felt confirmation for what he was doing and preaching and went back on a second missionary journey in chapter 16. And the second missionary journey, he initially planned to just go back where he had been and, and encourage all those churches in Galatia. But he felt God was calling him to come up into this region. But it says that the Holy Spirit prevented him from doing much here. And he wasn't sure why until he got a vision from God. You can read about it in uh, chapter 16, verses uh, 6 and onward. And when he's here, he gets this vision, and there's this man over in Macedonia, which was this area over here, which is still, there's still, Macedonia is still up in the northern part of Greece. And the, this, this man in the vision, this Macedonian man said, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so Paul re recognized that God was leading him to take the gospel for the very first time into Europe. You see, this is the continent of Asia, this is the continent of Europe, and in fact, Istanbul, the huge city in Turkey, which used to be Constantinople during the Roman Empire, is the only city in the world that is in two continents because half the city is on this side and there's bridges all across here. This is the Black Sea, cranes up there. And so Istanbul is right here. So this is one continent, this is another. And this is a, as he travels across, first into Neapolis and then to Philippi, this is the first time Christians had come and shared their faith in Europe. And when he got to Philippi, his, his normal strategy was to go into the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue in all these Roman cities, because there he would find Jews, and at least they had the commonality of, of worshiping the same God and having the Hebrew scriptures, and he could show them how Jesus had fulfilled those scriptures. That was always his strategy. 
Usually that didn't last long because they would, some, of, some would receive and some would, ex, would reject, and you'd have to go outside the synagogue to preach to the Gentiles. Well, in Philippi, there apparently wasn't a synagogue. You can visit it today. I've been there. But there was a river going by, and he goes down to the river and found some god fearers who were gathered for prayer, Lydia and some other women. Lydia was a prominent businesswoman with influence and a large home. And she became baptized and all of her household and her friends and the church started, the first church in, in Europe started in her house. Not long after that, there was opposition. You see, every, everywhere they went, there was either a revival or a riot. A revival or a riot. You see it over and over and sometimes both, many times both. And in Philippi, there was both. There was a revival, and then there was a riot, and Paul and Silas ended up in jail. You can read about the last part of Acts 16. Instead of sobbing and moaning and groaning and saying, God, why are you doing this to us? Even though they were, it was unfair, they were in stocks in a jail in the middle of the night, they sang praises to God instead. And God did a miracle and sent an earthquake, and the chains fell off, and the doors opened, and the jailer ended up baptized, and his whole family became a part of that church in Philippi. Paul and, and uh, Barnabas ended up going on. Or now Barnabas actually has gone on another missionary journey, and it's Timothy and Silas who are with Paul. It was Paul and Silas that were in that prison. And so uh, they end up going on down to uh, Thessalonica. It's still there today. You can visit it. It's called Thessaloniki now. It's a large city in Greece in the north. And, and they went down here. And once again, there was a, real, a revival and a riot. They started in the synagogue. Three weeks in, they got kicked out of the synagogue, start preaching to the Gentiles. And pretty soon, uh, because of opposition and persecution, they had to, to leave. And they went down to Berea right here. If you're driving down this highway towards Athens, it's a long drive. I've done it. You'll see a sign that says Berea, a little village up by the hillside. They went there to plant churches. And I love what it says. Very little, but what it says is powerful about the church in Berea. Acts 17, 6. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authority, shouting, These, oh, this is back in Thessalonica, sorry. Uh, just before they went to Berea, they, they dragged some of the believers in and they said, These men have turned the world upside down. And they've come here also. <laughs> I, I, I listen to that and I wonder, Are we still getting accused of that as Christ followers? If not, why not? Have we become complacent about Jesus? Are we more worried about what other people think than what God thinks? Are we more concerned about our, what our neighbors and coworkers might say negatively about us than what God might say positively about us when we stand before him someday? Are we lulled to sleep sometimes by our materialistic, easy lifestyle, entertained into stupor so that we have no spiritual power and no edge so that we could possibly you know, ever offend or energize anyone? Are we hoping that some politician will save us? I'm going to talk about that next week because there is only one Savior who never disappoints. And a lot of people are putting so much energy into getting saved by some politician and it ain't going to happen. Or are we solely focused on our one and only Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? So, as I said, Paul gets run out of town, and he goes to Berea, and I want to show you what happened there. Acts 17, 11. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. Why? Two reasons. For they received the message with great, what? Eagerness, and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I encourage you to be like the Bereans, more noble of character than the Thessalonians because two reasons you receive the teaching of God's word with great eagerness what we're doing right here isn't just a ritual it isn't just a routine or a tradition this is something God ordained and blessed remember in Acts 2 they devoted themselves to the teaching every week they were meeting together and when we come together like this, we're giving attention to the public teaching of God's word. God blesses that, and he uses that as formation in our lives. So they receive the word with great eagerness, and second, they examine the scriptures to see if it was so. And that's what I encourage you to do. Examine the scriptures for yourself to see if you agree. Don't just take everything I say or any pastor up here or any pastor you listen to on the radio or wherever, you know, on a, on a podcast or whatever. Examine for yourself 
your own personal study to bring, see if there's confirmation and clarification that comes. So once again, more converts, more opposition. Paul ends up leaving Silas and Timothy temporarily to strengthen the new churches. And he travels probably by boat 300 miles down to Athens. And that brings us to chapter 17, verse 16, where it says, While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. And so what did he do? It says he began to preach Jesus two places. In the synagogue, that was always where he went first. Jews believed the Hebrew scriptures. He went there, but he didn't stop there. He got outside the walls and he went to the marketplace, it says. The Greek word is agora. This was a place in every Roman city, a forum area, where there were temples, where there were banks, where there was trade, there was business, there was shopping, there was philosophy, discussions. It was the heartbeat of the Roman city, the agora, the marketplace. And so Paul went there to share the gospel. Now, here's an artist's uh, concept of what this might have looked like back in those days. This is the Agora. This large building on this end there is still there, and you can visit this Agora. Most of it is, is just an archaeological uh, dig now. It's a big temple down at the other end. And this was full of idols. Paul saw them everywhere, and it distressed him. And so because he, he, he felt distressed, he wanted to tell these people about the one true God. And so he walked through here. He met some scholars, some Epicurean and some Stoic philosophers. And they said, let's have a meeting. Let's have a meeting up on the Mars Hill, on the Areopagus. You see, up here is what we call the Acropolis. And up here is the Parthenon, which is still there. It's not in, in the same shape as it was, but you can still visit it today. Huge, this huge statue is gone. This was a statue to Athena, the god Athena that Athens is named after. And then over here, this rock, you can barely see it here, but there's a rocky formation here, which is called the Areopagus, in some translations, or Mars Hill, which means the same thing. And up there was a place of, of uh, judgment. Certain trials would happen there. Also a place of philosophy discussions for those who were um, scholars. And so they asked Paul to come up there and meet them and tell them more about his message that he was preaching. And you can go up there today. Here's some of our group climbing up onto the rock. There's the Acropolis, and behind that is the Parthenon. There's still some structures left from ancient um, <coughs> Greece. And I had a little congregation there. I was able to teach about what Paul taught in Acts 17 at that very location. And if you look behind me, you'll see down here is the ancient Agora. And, you know, you can walk through there, but it's mostly ruins, although there's a beautiful, well-preserved temple that's built 500 years before the time of Christ right here. And this is where Paul reasoned with the philosophers and talked about the idols and wanted to teach them about the one true God. And so just a moment or two of reflection from on Mars Hill. Hey, we can learn a lot from him. He says, I see that you're very religious because, hey, I'm looking around. And here's the temple. There's temples and, and there's idols. In fact, up there, there were huge idols that you could see and the, with the, the uh, gold glinting off them. And I just imagine him right now just saying, man, there's evidence everywhere that you guys are very religious and, and you're, you're seeking after truth. And he says, in fact, they even found one idol that says to an unknown God. And it's like, we got all these gods, but we might not have covered them all. We want to make sure we're covered, so we'll just put that one there for any others that we miss. And as a matter of fact, they have found inscriptions like that archaeologists have in the last 150 years. And you, and you can look that up. So Paul didn't blast them for being idolaters. He just said, I see you're very religious. He was winsome and attractive because we all are religious. God made us all religious. We're seeking for something. And a lot of times we look in the wrong places. He says, you've been looking in the wrong places. Even in unknown gods, I'm going to declare to you the true God. And he went on to preach the gospel there on Mars Hill. Next, he went to Corinth in chapter 18. And while he was there, he, he had the same thing. He had the normal pattern of going to the synagogue, getting opposition, going outside the synagogue. In fact, he uh, was able to lead the ruler of the synagogue to Christ and started a church right next door to the synagogue in that guy's house. Right. They got the Jews meeting here and the Christians meeting right next door with the former leader of the synagogue. And the church began to grow. He was there for a year and a half or so, and it was hard work in Corinth. 
And so he probably got discouraged, and I think the Lord was trying to encourage him when he gave him a vision in Acts 18, 9 and 10, and he said, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. Every time I read that, I know it was to Paul, but I find encouragement myself, because I believe he would say the same to us, hey, don't give up, there's many people here on the front range that are my people, but they don't know it yet. And I want you to be a part of the solution to reach them. Paul stayed in Corinth, as I said, a year and a half. And then he traveled back to Antioch, the original sending church, and gave a report. And then uh, chapter 18, 23 begins the third missionary journey. And during this journey, he goes back through all the churches, encouraging them, checking in on the work of the Lord, all the way back up through all these churches he planted, and then he goes back and he spends two years in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, he rents a public hall, probably on the Agora, the marketplace, and he, he teaches about Jesus, but he also trains pos- of, of pastors and sends them out into all these areas where the seven churches of Asia Minor, where Paul wrote to the, or John writes to them in the first part of uh, Revelation, they all were planted because of Paul's influence and, and John's influence as well as they were doing missionary work there. And in Acts 19, once again, we see there, there was both a revival and a riot. People started accepting the gospel, and what did they do? They stopped buying idols. The silver makers were making these little statues of Artemis. The Romans called her Diane. She was a goddess of fertility and prosperity. And they felt like if they bought these little um, silver statues and put them in their home or carried them with them, it would give them favor with the gods. But people started believing what Paul was preaching, that there is no God but one, and he is in heaven, and he doesn't want you making idols. And so they stopped buying them, and the silversmiths were not happy about that, so they started a riot. And this riot was significant because everybody gathered into the stadium. And you can still see it today. I just took this picture a couple weeks ago. There was a, there was a giant stadium that they've excavated there that seated 24,000 people, and it says it was full, and they shouted for two hours, you know, Artemis is great, Artemis is great, down with all this other false teaching. And they wanted to drag Paul in there, uh, but, they, but his disciples kept him from that. And um, you know that, that you're up against major opposition when a theater of, is filled with 24,000 people chanting against you, <laughs> opposing you. You see, that the gospel was relatively unopposed until it started to have an economic impact. And when the message of Christ started to infringe on people's lifestyle, many began, began to oppose it with vengeance. And we had an opportunity, it was a hot day, so we found some shade to gather and talk about Acts 19 together on our trip. And here's just a little snippet of that. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. Remember 250,000 people here? The whole city was in an uproar. And the people seized Gaius and Arst- Arstachus and These were two men who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And they all rushed together to the theater. Now, she said it's closed right now because of construction, so they're not going to be able to go in there. But when we walk out, we'll turn around, and you'll see the whole thing. You can just see parts of it right here. And uh, this wall over here is is part of it, but you can't see the whole thing as it wraps around. As as she said, seated 24,000 people. Now, that's bigger than than Ball Arena in Denver. You know, where the avalanche and the nuggets play. That's a lot of people. And, and all these people, it says, rushed. The whole city rushed. You know, 10% of them could sit there. But a lot of people <laughs> rushed together into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd. Now, that's something like the Apostle Paul. He's got a crowd, and he has one message, and that is to preach the gospel of grace in Christ Jesus. And he's got a captive audience who's all shouting about, uh, you know, the impact of the gospel. He wanted to come here but his disciples would not let him. <laughs> and they were wise because uh, Paul did not, did not need to put himself in unnecessary risk because God still had more for him to do. Eventually, we'll go to where he's buried in Rome, and, and he, he did end up losing his head. Good job filming that. I didn't know you were, you were going over there like that. That was great. <laughs> so Paul 
was sensitive to the Holy Spirit and so that he knew when to stay and face persecution, when to go and avoid it so that he could continue to spread the gospel. After these three missionary journeys, Paul went back to Jerusalem. There he was falsely accused. He was arrested. He faced five trials. Finally, because he wasn't getting a fair hearing, he appealed to Caesar, which he had a right to do as a Roman citizen, which he was. And because of that, he was taken as a prisoner to Rome. He always wanted to go to Rome. He talks about it at the beginning and end of the letter he wrote to the Romans before he'd ever been there. But he wanted to go as a missionary, not a prisoner. But in God's sovereign plan, he goes as a missionary in chains. And so you might call the trip to Rome his fourth missionary journey because everywhere Paul goes, he preaches. And he, he, he's, in, he's in captivity, but he's on, a, he's on a boat. And it's quite a story. If you want to read this story in the final chapters of Acts, uh, they get into this hellacious storm and they get shipwrecked on the island of Malta. He leads a bunch of people to Christ in Malta. They're there for three months. Finally, they continue their journey. When they get up here, this is around Naples, near uh, Pompeii in this area. They come ashore and a bunch of believers from Rome travel down. They got the message he was coming and they come and they encourage him and escort him to Rome. How the gospel got there, we don't know. Unnamed missionaries had already taken it there. And so he arrives in Rome and he goes into house arrest. Chapter 28, verse 16 says he lived on his own, although he was under arrest in a house where people could come and he could preach the gospel to them. And the last two verses of Acts read like this. <clears throat> For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you've been reading this story, it just ends abruptly like it's unfinished. And I'm like, well, where's verse 32? Where's chapter 29? How many have read Acts 29? It does, there isn't an Acts 29. You know why? We're Acts 29. It's intentionally written as an unfinished story because it's still happening. It's still going forward. The gospel is still advancing. It's still being written, and we're a part of it. Why didn't Luke finish the story? Why didn't he tell us that Paul got, finally got set free and he traveled for four more years? Why doesn't it tell us that he got rearrested when he came back to Rome and he, this time he got treated as a criminal and he languished in a damp dungeon writing to Timothy, his beloved son in the Lord? Where's the chapter about how he was tried and condemned and be, be, beheaded and buried outside the city? You can b visit his gravesite today. They built a church over it. It's called the Basilica of St. Paul outside the wall. And his tomb is inside. Here's our little group in front of a statue of Paul um, holding a sword representing the sword of the, sp the Spirit, the Word of God. Why isn't the story of Paul concluded? Because the story continues. We're Acts 29. It's the unfinished story. The story goes on. The church is still alive. The Holy Spirit is still bringing renewal and revival when we cooperate. Christians are still sharing their faith. Lives are still being changed. The gospel is still spreading around the world person by person. It's the unfinished book. And it will stay unfinished until this gospel of the kingdom is preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. I can't think of anything more important than collaborating together to take that message to others. I want to be like the Apostle Paul who declared, I am not ashamed of the gospel of grace, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. Now, in his day, to not be ashamed meant that you might be mocked, threatened, abused, stoned, beaten, imprisoned, or beheaded. Nevertheless, Paul was driven by the one thing that mattered most. And I, I'm, I find that inspiring. I want to be like that. Acts 20, 23, 24, our last verse. Paul says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. How's that for a life verse? If you would go over to our old um, church down there on the other side of the railroad tracks and pull back the carpet on the stage on the wood, you would see this verse starting right here with, I consider my life worth nothing, written there under where the pulpit stands. And if you come up here and pull this carpet back on this stage, you'd see it handwritten right here by me as well, because this is a life verse for me, and I want this to be true, that... Uh, 
I will finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. What about you? Is that what you want to be a part of? Would you stand with me for prayer? Father, thank you so much for giving us this exciting story of the, the birth and expansion of the first century church. Thank you for trusting us to be a part of the same story. May we be committed, like Paul, to finishing the race and completing the task. May we be gripped with passion for the lost, with joy for the gospel, with loyalty to Jesus. May it be true for all of us, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.